Well, everybody, it's um, it's week 12, and it's day one. I'm recording this on a Sunday afternoon, um, getting ready for class this coming week, the last week of classes. Our topic today is the rules of the road. My name is Sam Teal. Some of you know me. Many of you have seen me, and I've done a lot of these lectures. And um, looking forward to do, doing the last one of the semester. A couple of things before we get going. Um, well, first of all, we need to remember that this material on this lecture is going to be part of the final exam, which is still going to be scheduled, but of course it's going to be online. It will be Canvas with lockdown and respond as camera, and you'll be doing that. So make sure you're, you're all in good shape to do that. Uh, now, the other thing is, um, this is it. Your instructors will uh, will certainly be talking to you and uh, and saying goodbye. I'm sure they're going to be on on most likely will be on Zoom, and you'll have a you'll have a chance to ask them any any questions. So having said that, uh, let's get going on the lecture. Today we're talking about something called the navigation rules, maneuvering and uh, within those navigation rules. And that this is the booklet it comes out of the United States Coast Guard, comes out of the government printing office, and it's one of those things that the uh, students will be um, accessing. Maneuvering to avoid collisions. We're talking about the lights on a vessel, you know, those red and green side lights in the different configurations. And also we'll be talking about the sound signals. So let's get going. So the navigation rules that I just showed you. Well, navigation rules are also known as the rules of the road and they are sometimes known as the collision regulations. Or we just abbreviate that and say coal regs. They are international rules. Uh, countries have agreed upon them and they've accepted them by international treaty. They've all come to, to come to an agreement. There's been uh, treaties which have been signed and they're, everybody's doing the same thing. They're not optional. They are understood by all seafarers, or, seafarers of every seagoing nation. The United States, the Coast Guard exam for deck officers requires you to have a 90% correct in order to pass this portion of the rules. That's pretty extreme. There are 38 individual rules contained in the book in the inland and international rules. And just make that quick point that here in the United States, we've got a lot of inland waterways. And so we do have some special rules like for the Mississippi and the Columbia River. Places like that would be a good example. But generally, they're, they're very, very close to the international rules. You won't have to worry about that one. Not right now. Some of the rules we're going to talk about today is the one rules for lookout. All vessels have to have an appropriate lookout. All vessels have to travel at safe speed. All vessels must determine if risk of collision exists. And all vessels must take action if you need to avoid the collision. And you know, you, you should be saying to yourself, you should be saying to yourself, geez, Cam Teal, that's kind of obvious stuff. This doesn't seem that hard. Um, we're just, first of all, we're just skimming over this and, um, they're not meant to be hard. They're just meant to be really, really exact. And you have to follow them exactly. There's no wiggle room. You have to follow the rules. So here's a, here's the rules themselves. This one has, uh, uh number four. We're looking at number five and then over here, number six. So look out and save speed. Let's look at this. Uh, every vessel shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing as well as all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances so as to make full appraisal of situation and if or of risk of collision. Captain Teal, does that mean every vessel has to has to have a lookout assigned? Yes. But here's the deal. That lookout can be that singular person. You don't need to hire a different person. Now, when you have a vessel, large vessel, and you have extra different people, there you have a variety of people on board, you have extra personnel, 
yeah, we're going to assign someone to be the the lookout. And, and traditionally, that on a, on the training cruise, that's a freshman. When the Bowdoin goes off on on their uh, uh, summer training cruises with the VOT students, there will be a lookout assigned. That's that's just going to happen. If you're going across Castine Harbor on a 30 foot launch, somebody has to be the lookout, but it could be you. What if you got two of you and you're in a canoe? You're going across Castine Harbor next summer. You brought, brought your canoe up from home. It's a beautiful day and you're going out across the harbor. You're just kind of exploring the place. Yeah. Got to have a lookout, but it can be one of you. See how that works? If you have a kayak, you got to, you got to have a proper lookout. Every vessel, all the time, day and night, whatever the conditions are, you have to have a lookout. Well, you know, things aren't real good for you, and you don't have a boat like that. You don't have a kayak, a canoe. You don't have a little motorboat or anything like that. All you have is, um, you have a log. L-O-G. You have a log and a piece of wood, and you're going across Casting Harbor feeling, well, you know, you're happy you got the log, but that's all you got. My question to you is, do you have to have a lookout? Well, it's interesting. You do. It's interesting because um, the rule doesn't say how good your vessel is. It just says a vessel. And if you're using that log as a means of transportation on the water, which is the definition of a vessel, you have to have a lookout. Yeah, it can be you. So I'm making, obviously, a silly uh, statement there, but every vessel. What about safe speed? You know, safe speed is kind of like um, if you have an accident, you know what the police are going to tell you? And if not the police, you know what your parents are going to tell you? They're going to say, you were going too fast. You say, no, 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 I, I wasn't going too. Yeah, you were. If you had an accident, you hit somebody, you were going too fast. I mean, that uh, that's just the way it is. And so that's really the same thing here. I'm going to give you a couple of hints. I'm going to do, do the Captain Teal short version. Hint for the lookout rule. All the time, every available resource, eyes, ears, and electronic methods. Got it? How about for safe speed? The rule, the hint for the rule for safe speed, be able to stop before you hit somebody or something and take into consideration all the possible factors. Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is it fog? Is there a sandstorm? Is there like a gazillion different vessels around you? Or are you the only two vessels, you know, in the, in that part of the ocean? All of those things are going to determine what your safe speed is. So those are good, good, two good short versions. I got two more rules, the risk of collision and the action to avoid collision. Check this out. Every vessel shall at all times determine, I call this the determine risk of collision rule. Determine if risk of collision exists. And then it goes on to say, if there's any doubt in your mind, then assume it does. You can read more, but that's going to be the short version. Action to avoid. I'll, I'll just jump right over to the short versions here. Hint. For risk of collision rule, always be checking. Always be trying to determine if it's if there's a possible collision out there with another vessel. And if you're not sure, assume it's there. Assume there is a risk of collision. Now, I'm not saying when, you know, the ships are 100 miles apart that you'd say, oh, worries me, worries me. There's a risk of collision. I, I might hit that ship six hours from now. You don't even know it's there. I'm talking about when you're close enough to... Uh, you know, almost see each other. Maybe that's five, six, seven miles apart. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. It all depends on the situation. You know? But if you're not sure, if there's that little, that little, uh, that little um, voice in your head says, gosh, I, just, I don't know if this is bad or not, if there's risk of collision, gee whiz, just assume that, that there is and act accordingly. Well, how do I act? Well, that's going to be the action to avoid. Here's the short version. Take it early. Take early action. Don't wait until the last moment. Course changes are usually the best 
and don't do something that's going to make it worse. Did you get that? Take early action. Do it sooner rather than later. Don't wait till the last moment. Course changes are usually the best thing to do. And when it's all said and done, don't do something that's going to make it worse. I know I repeat myself. But there you go. We're going to talk about three possible scenarios that you could interact with other ships. A crossing situation, an overtaking, and a meeting situation. So know these. Crossing situation looks like this, and you'll see that they're, these are small boats. They're maybe 15 or 20 feet long. I've got the red and the green, the side lights marked. We'll talk about that, but you know the red and green, I suspect. One vessel is the giveaway vessel, and one vessel is the stand-on vessel. So now we're going to go on and we're going to talk about some possible scenarios when you meet other ships, when you have to apply those rules. So there's something called the crossing situation, the overtaking situation, and the meeting situation. And crossing, overtaking, one vessel is faster than the other, and then coming together, just like when you're driving a car. So we'll look at those more, uh, greater detail. I'm going to give you some definitions first, right here. So when two vessels are in close proximity of each other, so as to involve risk of collision, we have to categorize these vessels. We're going to sort of set up, separate them out. We're going to give them different names into one of the following. One vessel is going to be the giveaway vessel, that vessel which is ob obligated to change course or speed in order to avoid the situation. So this is the vessel that has to do something. Then there's the stand-on vessel, and the stand-on vessel, that's that vessel which is obligated, it's interesting, obligated to continue on the course and speed until the situation is passed and clear. You're just supposed to keep going, and the other vessel will go around you, or stop and avoid you. But your obligation is to stand on. Interesting. Here's the situations. Remember, it was crossing, uh, meeting, overtaking. Doesn't have to be in any particular order. So crossing, vessel A and B, and vessel A looks out there and sees at a distance off, doesn't matter if it's 100 yards or 10 miles. Depends on the size of the vessel, what would be appropriate to take action. Vessel A is the giveaway vessel. Vessel B is stands on, continued, continues, free to go on its course and speed. There's a little bit of a memory aid here. If you are at the steering wheel on this vessel, you could visualize yourself at the steering wheel, and you look out here across your bow, you would see red. You know, if I see a red stoplight, what does red mean? Stop. Don't keep going. You can stop or you can do, do something different, like change course, but don't just keep going. On the other hand, if you're over here on this vessel and you're at this location, right? If you're sitting there and you're at your steering wheel and you look out and you look from here and you look down to here, you're going to see green. So if you see that green, that means go. Stop, you know, traffic light, green, go. Keep going. Stand your ground, stand on. So there's your memory aid to do that. The next one is a, um, just like in a, when you're driving a car. If you're the faster vessel, you're vessel A, and you're coming up from behind, you're the one who's obligated to uh, make the maneuver. You're the responsible party. Vessel B is stand on. You shouldn't be changing your speed. You shouldn't be changing course. You should just be continuing on. Now, there is some, there are some special circumstances where the, the, uh, Governing bodies, the uh, the rules 
per se. They'll say you can talk to them by radio and different things, but you don't actually have to do that. Here in the international rules, we don't actually have to. We can. We don't have to. A, the overtaking vessel, just like when you're driving a car, is the responsible, the giveaway vessel. And then there's the last one, a meeting situation. Now, this is the one that's different. Make sure you know this. Like I said, this is going to be on the exam. Both vessels, the final exam, both vessels are required to alter course to starboard. Okay? Equally, mutually responsible. They are meeting head-on or nearly so, and there's a risk of collision. They're going to have a head-on collision. Both vessels have to alter course. Let's talk about let's talk about lights. Let's talk about lights on vessels. Now you know that during hours of darkness or reduced visibility, vessels are um, the rules say you have to show these lights. And classically, they're red and green and these white lights. And you see this little boat here. the the uh, The red and green lights are are all packed into one little device here on a sailboat. They're separated here on a tugboat. You can see they're separated. There's two lights up here. There's two lights on the stern. One is yellow. That's a little bit different. Different vessels have different light configurations, but we're going to talk about just one. So here's your must know for the final exam. This is lights for a power driven vessel equal to or greater than 50 meters. So 50 meters. By the way, multiply 50 times 3.28. That's the conversion factor. It's about 165, 170 feet. 165 feet. That's how big, that's that number converted. You probably should know that. 3.28 is the conversion factor from feet to meters. So there's two masthead lights. These are called the masthead lights. They're on top of the mast, the forward masthead light, the after masthead light. A red and green side lights, they're mounted on the bridge wings, and the stern light, also white, back there on the stern. Notice they're shaped sort of like a piece of pie. On the state of Maine, the masthead lights are here and here, and the side lights are here and here, and the stern light, well, <clears throat> of course, we can't see it. Know this diagram for the final. And this has to do with what's called the arc of visibility. So the masthead lights, both of them, forward and aft, have an arc of visibility of 225 degrees all the way around. That's the slice of the pie. It's a big piece of pie. It's more than half a pie, however you want to think about it. The port and starboard side lights are 100 12.5, 112.5. So you put those together, multiply this 112.5 times 2, you see they come together and they would fill the same arc of visibility of the masthead lights. Well, the only place that's not filled in by anything is the stern light. And coincidentally, that's 135 degrees, which would be this mount, amount right there. 225 plus 135 that would give you your 365, 360, <laughs> 360 degrees of coverage. Running lights of a ship are controlled from the wheelhouse. They can be elaborate. Look at this ship here. This is a, a very elaborate ship. They can be small and simple for perhaps a, a smaller vessel. These are antique mastheads and side lights. This is a stern light. If one of these blows out, the bulb blows out, instantly you can switch over to a secondary one. Actually, all these lights have secondary lights so that you could, with a flip of a switch, you would. Uh, you don't have to climb the mast in the middle of the night or the raging storm in order to uh, change the bulbs. You can get to it the next day when it's safe. We're getting towards the end, folks, and the ship's whistle. Well, let's see. It's the same whistle which is used for the emergency, uh, fire and emergency, or the abandoned ship signal. We've, we've talked about that. But this one, is, although it's the same whistle on the ship right here, it's used differently. It's used to communicate 
and to inform nearby vessels of what you are doing, what you are doing. One short blast means you are altering your course. You intend to alter course to starboard. Two short blasts means that you are altering your course to port. See, you're letting somebody know what you're doing with a blast of a whistle. Three short blasts, you're telling them that you're, you're uh, using a stern propulsion. You know, it's kind of like you're backing out of a parking spot. You think about a busy harbor and you're getting to, you're getting to ready to take the, the stern of the vessel and poke it out into the, the flow of traffic, well, you're going to let everybody know that you're coming with three short blasts. A short blast is about one second in duration. That'll be on the final. Well, here we are. We're, we're, we're right there at the last slide. Last slide of the last week in NS101. I'm sure your teachers are going to say uh, adios to you and check in with you, but for, for me, I'll just... Uh, to my students and others who I've met, take care. It's been a pleasure working with you and teaching you. So let's finish this last slide up. Ship's whistle used as a warning signal when you're in the fog. Now, you, you, you might not be able to imagine this, but there are times on the training ship where it is so thick, the fog is so thick that you can't see the bow from the wheelhouse. Boy. So you're using the signal when you're in restricted visibility. It is one prolonged blast, and that means four to six seconds every two minutes. Yeah, every two minutes. It is loud, and it'll wake you up. And if you're not ready for it, and somebody starts the foghorn, and you're standing out on deck, you'll just about jump out of your own skin. And then it goes on and on for every two minutes. It's loud. It'll wake you up. But it's there for a reason to warn other ships of your presence. The lookout on our ship is listening for that. The lookout hears that. It's going to call up the bridge and say, I hear the fog signal of another vessel. If you can tell if it's coming from the port side or starboard side, that's great. But it's giving warning that you're there. Okay. All that's going to be on the final exam. So this is Captain Teal signing off NS101 Fall Semester 2020. Roger that. See you later.